All right, so let's start chapter 11. So now we're going to talk about corporations. Uh, we've been discussing about corporations for a full term, but well, this is just an overall um, view on what a corporation is and then many rules and obligations, uh, roles of um, agents, directors, uh, executives. All right, so we start looking at this important definition of incorporation related to being it a separate legal entity. So a corporation is like, as they say, a fiction, legal fiction. A corporation is a person but not a human being, is a legal person, a person created by the law. The law creates a corporation as a person. So a sole proprietor is the human being, the person behind it, as we discussed. Partners, the people behind the partnership, they are the partnership, but not for corporation. Corporation is different. Corporation, there's this separate legal person that is the corporation. So when we say the owners of the corporation, actually they are the shareholders. They are those who hold shares. What is a share? Share is, well, very briefly saying share is a right. When I am a shareholder, it means I have rights over a corporation, right? So this aspect, that the corporation is a legal person has some consequences, important consequences. Well, first of all, who owns the assets of the corporation? So let's say the corporation has a building, has machinery, has trademarks, patents. Who owns those assets? The corporation does. The corporation, does. The corporation itself. This separate legal person owns the assets, not the shareholders. The shareholders, they have rights over the corporation, but they don't own the assets. It is the corporation that owns the assets. And then when we talk about vicarious liability, who is liable? Who is vicariously liable? or the wrongful conduct of employees? The corporation or the shareholders? The corporation, because the corporation is the separate legal person. Well, let's say if Apple, if Apple were a sole proprietorship, sole proprietorship of Steve Jobs, would Apple exist today? No, it would not, because the sole proprietor passed away. It goes fast away. But because Apple was a corporation, the fact that the main shareholder passed away, the corporation is still there. Because the corporation is this separate legal person. The corporation doesn't die when the shareholders pass away. Right? So that's very, very important. And as I said, a, an owner of a corporation is actually a shareholder, someone who owns shares. And it is, and the shareholders, they don't own the assets. It is the corporation itself that owns the assets because corporation is this legal fiction. It's like matrix creation by the law. Another consequence of the separate legal person is that shareholders have limited liability. Different from sole proprietorship, different from general partnership. A shareholder, all they can lose is the money they have invested. So let's say this morning, you bought shares from Apple, 
And in afternoon, you heard that Apple went bankrupt. How much can you lose? Can you lose your savings? No, you can't. All you can lose is the amount you have invested. But you are careful. Are you following? Is it all making sense? Okay, that's what a corporation is. So shareholders, they will buy shares or shares will be issued to them in exchange of money. And they will become, quote unquote, the owners of the corporation. But we already know ownership of a corporation means holding shares, owning shares of a corporation. And then the corporation, this separate legal entity, is the one buying assets. So that business is performed, is carried out. Well, the role of agents. If a corporation is a separate legal person, a corporation itself doesn't exist in a tangible way, in a material way. Is that right? It doesn't exist, it's illegal, it's paperwork. So who does the business of a corporation? Who carries out the business of a corporation? Agents. Who are those agents? Employees, officers, managers, everyone involved with the corporation. So when we discussed the law of agency here uh, last week, I told you that I am an employee of BCAT, but I am also an agent because I represent BCAT when I am delivering this lecture. So an employee of a company, when they deal with third parties, they are also representing a company. So on the top of being an employee, they are also an agent, right? All right, so some advantages, limited liability, as I said. So all you can lose, is the money you have invested. But there's an exception. The exception is if the courts decide to lift your corporate veil. Lifting the corporate veil, here is a metaphor. You know, when the, um, when the, you know the veil, when there's a wedding, so there's a veil for, for that. Covering the, face. Covering the face, but who is who is wearing this dress? How do we call this? The bride. The bride. Yeah, so the bride is wearing this beautiful dress. It's a very cover. So here's a metaphor because this limited liability is known to be this veil, this protection. However, in some circumstances, the courts they may lift this veil. They may Break this protection. Okay. So the best example here would be if a corporation uh, is involved in fraudulent activities. So let's say I am the only shareholder uh, of a corporation. So I went to a bank. I borrowed $10,000 for the corporation as an agent of the corporation. But I used the $10,000 on my own personally. I used it to go to Hawaii. And then I spent one month in Hawaii. When I was back, I defaulted payment. I didn't pay for this loan. So now the bank will sue the corporation. The corporation cannot afford. So the bank, if they find out I use the money on my, for myself, for my own benefit, they can ask the court to lift the corporate veil. And then they can come after my personal assets as a shareholder. But lifting the corporate veil is an exception. Courts, they don't like to lift the corporate veil. They have strict requirements to lift the corporate veil. The example I gave you is just a simple example so that you understand what lifting the corporate veil would be. Okay? But it's... In general, courts don't like to lift the corporate veil. In general, courts respect this limited liability a lot. Okay? It could also be that you give a personal guarantee when you get a loan. This is not fraudulent, but when you give a personal guarantee, you are waiving your limited liability because you are saying to the bank or to a financial institution, you are saying, hey, 
if you give money to my corporation, if the corporation cannot afford repaying the loan, I will pay you. So we have studied this already as a guarantor. Remember, parents guarantee transaction for their children. Okay. So this is another situation in which the liability, the limited liability would not be applicable. Okay. All right, some other advantages. Taxes, again, I won't discuss tax, but su su succession and transferability. Well, because a shareholder, they own shares, shares are assets, they are rights, but they are assets. So those shares, they may be transferred. I own 10 shares from Apple. I can share those shares to my friend to my daughter, to my relative, whoever I want, right? Or I can even give the shares in a will. I can prepare my will and the shares I hold, I will be giving to a certain person or an entity, right? Because they are seen as assets as well. Shareholders, they owe no duty to the company. If you are only a shareholder, you owe no duty to a company. What does this mean? It means you can compete with the company you own shares. You can be a shareholder of Apple and a shareholder of Samsung at the same time as a shareholder only. But if you are a director, then it's going to be different. Okay. Some advantages. Well, because the corporation is created by the law, is created through paperwork, it requires more professionals. It requires, it may require accountants, lawyers. So it's a bit more complex to manage a corporation. Changes in the corporation require documents. Activities may require approval, may require resolutions. So it's a bit more complex. Can you be the only shareholder of a corporation? Can a corporation have only one shareholder? Yes, that's okay. And actually most companies are like this. Most companies in the world, I would say. Most companies are small companies with only one shareholder. Most companies. That's totally possible. However, if there are more, if there's more than one shareholder, then another disadvantage is that if a shareholder has minority ownership of theirs, they may be ruled out. All decisions that majority shareholders take, they will be followed. Minority shareholders, they have some protections in law. But those are protections. Those are not to be used when the majority shareholders want to go one way. So let's say if majority shareholders, they want to go without, let's say majority shareholders of Apple, they want to extinguish the iPad, the tablet business unit. They want to extinguish. The company is going to go like this. Minority shareholders will be removed. Out. Okay, so that's another disadvantage. Remember, in a partnership, if a major, sorry, if there's a change that is major, then unanimous consent is required. But not here in the corporation. All right, I'll skip this. So now, process of incorporation. For exams, you don't need to know the details of incorporating a company. Incorporating a company, you can go to smallbusinessbc.com. You can find a lot of um, articles, blogs, and even governmental um, services that will help you start your own corporation. Why do governments help people start their own corporation? Why is the government so interested that people start corporations? People's corporation or people taxes. 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 It can help the economy. It can help the economy. Exactly. So if they make money, 
They may help the economy by paying more taxes, by hiring more people, by attracting technology, by developing products, international trade, etc. So governments, they want to help you set up your own corporation. Well, I just want to share with you here with regards to uh, incorporating, uh, incorporation, that in Canada, there can be provincial corporation or federal corporation. You will be a provincial corporation if you do business within the province. If your place of business is within the province. So if you have a coffee shop, for example, if you have a pet shop, you'd better be a provincial corporation. Can you be a federal corporation? Yes, you can, but you don't need to. If you have different places of business in different provinces, then you'd better be a federal corporation. Can you be a provincial corporation and do business, have places of business in other provinces? Yes, you can, but you need to register in other provinces as well. So that's why it's better to be a federal corporation. But you can. Okay, so just keep that in mind. These are possible. So, because we know that a corporation is this legal creation, to create a corporation, you have to file documents. You have to file a form that creates a corporation that sets out the place of business, that sets out the name of the directors, how many shares will be initially issued, et cetera, et cetera. And also, corporations, they will have documents such as their bylaws. What is a bylaw? Standards by which the company operates. How company operates? Um, like, what are the rules that are going to follow? Rules, yes. So, bylaws, they are rules with obligations and rights. There's a strata bylaws. What is a strata bylaw? If you live in an apartment or in a townhouse, condo, the strata by laws will say what you can do, what you cannot do. If you can have a pet, if you can have a barbecue in the patio, uh, till what time you can uh, enter, enter or no, not enter, but uh, use the gene, for example, because you can enter and leave at any time in principle. Uh, so, but rules of uh, good living, living in harmony. So for a company, the bylaws, they have the same function, but same function within shareholders, within directors. And the bylaws of a corporation here in BC, they are known as articles. So the articles, they will have 20, 30, 50 sections detailing, setting out the rules, obligations, and rights of people involved in the corporation. How many directors will a corporation have? What's their place of business? Can they issue more shares? Are there specific rights for shareholders? Et cetera, et cetera. Those are examples of rights and obligations that will be in an articles. So to form a company in BC, you have to file a document that is called notice of articles. And in about 24, 48 hours, you receive a confirmation of the filing of the notice of articles and your corporation is created. And then the articles themselves, they don't need to be filed. You can also go online and you can get a template article filed. But again, the more serious you are, you are about your corporation or the corporation you want to form, the more uh, likely you should seek legal advice. The lawyers, they will then customize the articles for your needs, the needs of your partners as shareholders. Okay? So a company is created by documents because it's a legal person. This is what I want you to understand. Now, capacity. Well, Corporations in general, they have full capacity. They can enter into any contracts, any transactions, unless shareholders want 
to limit the capacity of the corporation. They may want to limit. And if they want to limit, where will they do this? In the articles. In the articles, there will be a section in which capacity is limited. So again, it may be the case that shareholders want to limit the capacity for the corporation to get a loan. Loans over a certain amount, they may require unanimous consent by shareholders. It's just an example, right? So shareholders, they may interfere with capacity. Now, funding of a corporation. Well, a corporation may be funded. We call it equity by equity funding or credit relationship. There's two ways a corporation will be funded. In one way, people or entities that put money in the corporation, they will receive shares, they will receive rights for the money they are putting in the corporation. Another way is to lend money. To lend money, you don't get shares. You are in a credit debt relationship. You are a creditor. So it's different. Well, with regards to equity, with regards to equity, so you will get shares. Shares, they can be par value or no par value. No par value is the most common type of share that are used. No par value means that the value of the shares will be determined by the market, by, by evaluation. Par value is when the company sets the value. So the company says that each share is worth $1. It's a fixed price. No par value is more common because depending on the valuation of the company, the company is worth 1 million, 1 billion, then this amount is divided by the number of shares available. This is the market value of a company. Like last year or two years ago, if I'm not mistaken, Apple was a one trillion worth company. How do we know? Because the number of shares available multiplied by that daily value of each share. Because Apple shares or some of Apple shares, they are no par value. I cannot say all are because I don't know, but some I know are because some are in the stock market. Right? And then shares, they could be um, common shares or preferred shares. Well, just here in this course, because in real life, shares, they can be mixed. Shares may have several different rights and obligations. But here for us, in our course, shares will be common shares. Those who own common shares, they actually are the owners of the corporation, quote unquote owners, because they are the ones with a right to vote. They can vote for directors. Directors are the one managing the corporation, setting the strategy of the corporation. And there's the preferred shareholders. Preferred shareholders, they don't have a right to vote. In general, as I said, it could be different in real life. In general, preferred shareholders have no right to vote, but they have a preference to receive dividends. So in summary, for us here, if we studied this in law school, it's going to be different. It's going to be more detailed, not different, but more detailed. So for us here, in principle, preferred shareholders, they are the ones who are merely investors. They are aiming at getting dividends whenever they are paid. And common shareholders are the ones, the real owners, the ones who want to vote, who want to decide on the way the company goes. Are we good? <clears throat> And now, as I said before, companies, they may borrow money. They may borrow money from a single creditor as a loan. Or they may borrow from multiple creditors at the same time. And how do they borrow from multiple creditors at the same time? Through what is called debentures or bonds. 
So companies, they issue, let's say, millions worth of debentures or millions worth of bonds. Those are actually, those are documents in which investors are giving money to the company and they will be repaid with a certain interest, right? The difference is that a debenture has no asset to secure. A debenture is merely a promise to repay. So if you buy 1 million now, I promise to repay you in two, three, four years with four, five, 10% interest. If they don't repay, you have to sue them. But there's no asset to secure. If they go bankrupt, you lose. Whereas a bond, a bond, there will be an asset securing the bond. So in case they fail, they default, repurchasing the bond, you can go after their asset. You can seek their asset to be seized and then sold. So that's what we just went through. Equity is related to buying shares, being becoming an owner of a company. And a credit debt relationship is when you lend money to a corporation, okay? Those are different. Uh, do you have a right to, if you put money in a company as a shareholder, as a shareholder, do you have a right to get your investment back? Okay, so you invested, let's say 1 million buying shares of a corporation. Do you have a right to get the 1 million back? Or even more? I can sell the shares, but the price that I get would be more than shares. Right? You may be able to sell the shares, but the price, but the price may vary. What if the company is doing not good and the 1 million is now worth 100,000? Can you demand the difference? No. no, you can't. In other words, Buying shares is risky. If you lend money to a company, if you lend 1 million, can you demand the 1 million back? Yeah. Yes, you can because you are a creditor. It may also be risky because the company may have no assets to pay you, but still here you are not a shareholder. You are only a creditor. So you have a right to that money back. Is this clear? All right. Now, there are closely held corporations and broadly held corporations. As I said before, most companies in most countries, they are closely held corporations. The small companies. Companies with one shareholder, two, three, very few shareholders. Broadly held corporations are those in which the shares, some of their shares, are available at the stock market. They are few companies in a given country. And because they are broadly held, because their shares are offered to the public, they are more regulated. They have more obligations. For example, they have to publish audited financial statements. This doesn't apply for closely held corporations unless the shareholders demand. But if shareholders don't demand, don't agree on this, the law doesn't require. There may be some restrictions here to sell shares. Not all, but some companies, shareholders, they agree on what is called preemptive rights. So preemptive rights are, if you are a shareholder you have, and you want to sell your shares, you have to offer your shares to another shareholder first. So they have the right of first refusal. If a current shareholder is not interested to purchase your shares, then you can go ahead and, and sell to third parties. 
Okay, this is very common in closely held corporations. <laughs> now, directors. Directors will be elected by shareholders, by common shareholders. And directors, they do owe a duty to the corporation. Remember that shareholders, they owe no duty to the corporation. But directors, they owe a duty to the corporation. In other words, directors cannot work for competing companies unless there's a disclosure and consent. So they owe a duty to the corporation and they are actually in a fiduciary duty relationship with the corporation. Do they owe a duty to the shareholders that elected them? No, the duty is owed to the corporation. So the fact that a shareholder elected me as a director, I don't need to um, look after the shareholder's interest. I need to look for or look at the company's interest first. Directors, they may be personally liable for any of these if they don't pay taxes, if they don't pay wages. And because of this, uh, usually directors, they, um, companies, they pay liability insurance for directors. Usually. And then directors, they will hire senior management, they will hire executives, CEOs, CFOs, etc. Those will hire managers who will then hire employees. Actually, this is more for a medium to large corporation, so more structured companies. They will have shareholders electing directors, directors appointing officers, and then officers managers and employees. Senior management, they also owe a duty to the corporation. I cannot be a CEO for Apple and Samsung at the same time because I would have conflict of interest. Shareholders, they have some rights even though they owe no duties to the corporation, they have some rights and remedies. One of the most important rights will be to vote at the annual general meeting of a corporation. They also have a right to see or to have access to financials or some records of the companies. Question for you with regards to fiduciary duty. You agree? Yes. Directors are directors in a fiduciary relation, fiduciary duty with a corporation? Yes, they are. Who is the agent in a fiduciary relationship with? The principal. The principal, not the third party. Officer. Who are they in a fiduciary relationship with? The corporation. The corporation, not the shareholders. Director, the same thing. The corporation, not the shareholders. Do shareholders owe a duty to the corporation? No, they don't. So that's why all these are wrong. E is the right one. Are we good? All right. So shareholders, that uh, minority shareholders, because they can be ruled out in the majority decisions, they have some protections in law. I want to call your attention to this one, derivative representative action. So if a company suffers a loss and directors decide not to sue the party that caused them loss, for whatever reason, they don't want to sue, Minority shareholders, they can sue under their own name 
but on behalf and interest of the corporation. Because as a minority shareholder, if the company goes into loss, they are, their rights are also being affected. So the company sold goods to a client, the client didn't pay for the goods, directors decided not to sue for whatever reasons. So minority shareholders decided to start a lawsuit on their own name, but on behalf and the interest of the corporation. This is what the derivative or representative action will be. So that's the main, one of the main uh, remedies minority shareholders have. You may read about the other uh, remedies, but you don't need to uh, give too much attention for examples. That's why I'm focusing mainly on this one. Dividends. Do shareholders have a right to dividends? Yes. No. No. There's no right to dividends. Companies, they may declare dividends or not. Well, first of all, a company has to go on profit on a certain given fiscal year. And if they go on a profit, directors may decide to pay dividends or they may decide to keep the profits for the launch of a new product, for the purchasing of another company, for cash, to keep cash for future opportunities. So there's no guarantee of a dividend. No right to a dividend. As an investor, if you want to buy shares of corporations that pay dividends on a yearly basis, now that you learn that you have no right to a dividend, what would you do? What? You buy shares. Okay, but any companies? Which ones? Companies have a chance to grow the share. Okay. Uh, companies that have a chance to grow the share, but it's still risky. We never know if they're going to grow or not. Because we have no right to dividends. This is not a this is not financial advice. This is just general knowledge. If you want to be paid dividends, you should buy shares of companies that have a history of paying out dividends. If they have a history of paying out dividends, it means it's more likely that they will keep on paying yearly dividends than not. It's still not a right. It's still not a guarantee, but it's more likely that they will keep on paying out dividends than not. I think Coke is an example. Banks are other examples. But again, no guarantee. And this is not financial advice. Okay? That's what we, you would do. Now, as I said before, for more medium to large corporations, shareholders, they will elect directors. Directors will form a board of directors. They will meet every three months, every four months, every six months, depending on the company, depending on their rules. And they will set the strategy of the company. They are the ones appointing CEOs, CFOs, and then managers, and then employees. Can you be a shareholder and a director? Yes, you can. Can you be a shareholder, a director, and a CEO? Yes, you can. If you are the only shareholder of a corporation, more likely that you are shareholder, director, CEO, CFO, CMO, all the Cs. You are a manager. You are the employee. You are everything. It may be. Yes, now let's look at Apple. If I'm not mistaken, Steve Jobs, one of the main shareholders, was also a director, was appointed CEO. Directors fired him as CEO. And then he was appointed CEO again 
some years later. Your duty to the corporation depends on what position you have. Usually for startups, the main scientist, scientist involved in the company or the, the creator, the inventor, they will be the main shareholder usually. They will also be one of the directors and they are usually appointed CEO. And then as the company grows, maybe they leave as being CEO, they get a professional CEO to make the company grow and they are more here in the strategy level as a director. Sometimes this is not a, a rule. Usually it goes like this. Are we good? So because a, comp a company is created, is this legal person, it has to be created with filing forms for a company to be ended, to be dissolved. There's also a form. So you have to file a dissolution form. So you will file um, this document with the province, if it is a provincial company, or with the federal government, it's a, if it's a federal corporation. All companies, they have to file this document every year that is called the annual return. The annual return is just a way for the government to know or to have the updated information of the company. Place of business, name of directors, name of senior executives. If there's any change, you have to inform the change every year. If there's no change, you just repeat what you have. But every year you have to file this annual return. If you fail to file for two consecutive years, the company is automatically dissolved. So most companies, because they are small, most companies will be dissolved by neglecting to file the annual return. I started a company, the company didn't do well, so I just stopped filing the annual return. The company is um, dissolved automatically by the corporate. Okay, that's how it is. We're going to see uh, bankruptcy, how bankruptcy affects a company in chapter 15. Not now. So we'll get back to corporation there. Questions or comments? My question to you is, if you were to start a company now, sorry, if you were to go on business now, your own business, would you go as a sole proprietor? Would you go as a partnership or would you go as a corporation? And why? Partnership. Partnership. Sole proprietorship, okay. Partnership. Partnership, why? Um, if we are in partnership with an already established or uh, we can be guided or kind of help from them, if we, uh, if we both benefit from each other, with it, right? you would start a partnership with an already established, yeah, like. If we are, it, it could be, but I don't. I don't see a clear partnership. Uh, let's think in about a business. Sorry, in a same business, but we cater to different customers. Like, okay, uh, it's a restoration business, but one is for cars and one is for Items. Okay, so you would start a different uh, business under okay, a partnership. The same category okay. The partner. What about uh, liability? Liability of partners, as we learned, unlimited liability. What would you do with unlimited liability? Would you be okay with liability? What if uh, the services that you provide caused the cars or whatever the machine was uh, issues, and then you would be sued for thousands or millions of dollars. Your personal assets would be at risk. Would you be comfortable with this? 
This is something to consider. Yes. Measures of the human supply of the partnership because it's giving out some benefit from taxes and the limit of liability that they have. Okay. So an LLP, limited liability partnership. Okay. Uh, with sole proprietorship, right? And are you so you would have no partners? You would be on your own. I yeah. What about uh, limited liabilities? Acceptable. You would accept this. Okay. Would anyone go with a corporation? I can afford it. If I can afford it, if you can afford, you would choose corporation. Yeah. yeah. It's not that expensive. It's, it's certainly more expensive than uh, others because you may need lawyers to help you with documents, but not that expensive. And um, the tax code, because your zero revenue is little, but you must pay a lot of tax. With a corporation? Okay. Yeah, you have the corporate tax, but then um, you can also use the corporation as a tool to not to avoid taxes, but to work tax in a more efficient way. You could. Yeah. It's, it's more complex, but you could. All right. So that's uh, business organizations. So we went through um sorry just stop uh, recording so 